Strastriche recruit. Back at the beginning of the year, I said that I was going to start looking at games that I walked away from. The idea was that sometimes games deserve to have a second chance. And so the first one that we're going to be doing this year is Metro Exodus. Okay, so why did I actually walk away from Metro Exodus? I got frustrated with it early on and then had a bunch of other things that I decided to play instead and never went back to it. I think the thing that frustrated me was that the early game really limits you in terms of what you can do, how effective you are, the enemies that it throws at you, and that you run out of ammunition very quickly. And so if you're looking to play the game, and you start out in those opening sections, you might drop off of it if that starts to get annoying. The, uh, the other thing is that you may get a little bit lost as to what you're supposed to do. You'll be ambling around the map in the first chapter and trying to figure out exactly where you're supposed to even go. And Metro Exodus is one of those games where it doesn't hold your hand. Uh, if you're used to that in other games, you are going to be sorely lacking for it here. But the reason why I thought it deserved a second chance is because I had played other Metro games. This one was structured significantly different, but I wanted to see what it actually held, that there was a lot more game to be had, and that there were other chapters, and I wanted to see where the game actually went. The other thing is that I felt like it had really good potential. One of the reasons why I think it had great potential to it was the interface, or I should say the minimal interface that it has. Some people have talked about Dead Space and the very cohesive UI that it uses in comparison to a lot of modern games that just have this huge, uh, you know, just amount of data all over the screen, a lot of it very superfluous. Dead Space is the game that a lot of people reference as having a really good UI because your life totals are on the spine of your suit, your, uh, your clip count is actually right on the gun, uh, your sight is down the line, so there's nothing really extraneous around for, like, life bars and mini-maps and all of that. I think Metro Exodus also stands in that camp. It's one of the really interesting parts about the game. Your sighting can be done right through the gun. You don't even have to have a reticle on screen. Your directional is on a compass that's on your arm, that you can see. Your radiation meter is also, like, right on your arm. If you want to look at the map, you can actually bring up a map that's on a clipboard, and you can see your position relative to everything that's on that map. If you're losing life, you just start to see, like, blood around you, and that gets harder and harder and, and, and more prevalent. There is no life meter. You start coughing, you probably need to put on a gas mask. If you need to change the filter on your gas mask, you will hear a beeping sound. There is really nothing that is like a heads-up display, a HUD, that you are looking at, which makes for a very immersive experience. It feels like you're actually in the game itself. One of the best user interfaces that I have seen honestly. So wouldn't it be worth trying the game again? Really making a good faith effort to play through Metro Exodus. And so, I did. I actually completed Metro Exodus. And I also completed the two kernels, and I have almost completed Sam's story. Real quickly, those are, those are very nice expansion pieces. They're not too lengthy. Sam's story is like an, another open world area for you to explore. The two kernels is much more linear, but tells uh, a separate story to the main one that you didn't really get for context. So, But I want to focus on the main game. You are playing Artyom, again, always, and you 
are leading your little squad out of the metro because Artyom has this idea that actually the world outside is not a radiative hellscape, that there are places in this world, this post-apocalyptic radiative world, that you can live above ground. And so he and his team steal a train to go out into the world to find a place where they can actually create a settlement. And the storyline is really about that. It is literally about their exodus from the Metro, hence the name of the game. And it takes place in a series of open world areas. This is really what I thought was very interesting about the game, is that you'll have shooters, and I really do think that this is a shooter more than anything else. You'll have shooters that take a very linear approach, chapter by chapter by chapter, where you pretty much know the direction you're going in and you need to get from point A to point B. Then there are open world games where you just go around one continuous map. Metro Exodus does something in the middle. There are chapters. You go from one map to the next map to the next map, and you do essentially have to get from point A to point B to get through that chapter. But there are side missions and quests and exploration that you do in those areas themselves. So you have sort of open world places, but you're not there for the entire game, and you don't go back to them. It's this one chapter. Like I said before, that first chapter can feel very rough. You are starting out with just your basic weaponry. You don't have a lot of upgrades and mods unlocked for different guns, and you don't necessarily have a lot of ammunition either. So you're starting out in this world, and the first things that you usually encounter are the various monsters. If you defeat the monsters, they have no supplies on them. They might be guarding places that have supplies, but they themselves, no matter how many you kill, there's, there's nothing on them. The bandits and other human characters that you have that might be shooting at you, well, they will have stuff on them. Parts and pieces that you can use to upgrade or clean your weaponry. And then also mods for your guns and new models of guns. And those are ones that you can salvage from your enemies but only those specific ones. So you start to realize very quickly that it is really not sensical to try and engage with anything but the human enemies that are attacking you. Everything else that comes after you is just going to be a complete waste of your ammunition, and you get nothing from it. Once you do get acclimated to the game, and you do get used to like looking at your map and looking at your compass and everything, it becomes a little bit simpler to understand what you're supposed to do and where you're supposed to go. I still found myself in that first area exploring around a lot without realizing how to easily find my next objective because I wasn't looking at the map or anything. So I did spend a lot of time just faffing around the map. But that's okay too. You can do that. Real quick though, I will say that the crafting system in this game is really interesting. One, because they simplify the parts required so that it's not like here's, here's 15 different kinds of components that you can use, which is what a lot of games will do, but they really just focus it back into like scrap and chemicals. That's it. You just collect those. Uh, you will salvage them out of the world and off of enemies, etc., uh, and those are the two things that you use. And so it's a combination of those when you want to repair things, craft, you know, explosives or uh, bullets or anything like that. That's all you have to use. Some stuff you can actually craft on the fly. So you find a place where enemies aren't going to attack you immediately because it's all done like in game. You open up your backpack and you can craft a variety of things right there on the fly. You can actually craft your med packs on the fly. You can craft filters for your gas mask on the fly. You can 
trade out different parts for your guns as you unlock them on the fly. However, if you want to make bullets, for instance, you will need a crafting station. They are in various places around the map, but you do have to kind of seek them out. And of course, there's like one on the train. So you can use that one, at least after Act 1. What is interesting, though, is that after you get past that first act, there are some more linear sections that kind of take you from one hub area to another. Once I got to, like, the second hub area, though, I realized that there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can do. One, because I could trade out different models of my guns. Once you unlock the table that's actually at the train, you can take the entire frames of guns and swap them out. So now I can customize what my two main weapons and then, like, my third stealth weapon are and really customize them the way I want. As you go through the game, you get more custom pieces, and this helps you figure out how you want to play the game. So now you have a lot more customization in how you're going to address things. It is actually a lot of fun going around these open worlds and exploring and doing various activities in the game. It is also interesting because sometimes people will tell you about stuff that are secondary objectives and might reward you for having done those secondary objectives. And this is also a, a very interesting experience because it's not really laid out for you how to do a lot of those things. It is sort of up to you to uncover that. Like I said at the beginning, this game does not hold your hand. You have to work out a lot of stuff for yourself. When you do, though, it feels very satisfying. It's not so obtuse that you can't figure out how to do that, but at the same time, you do have to put some effort in to making those things work. There were some things in the game that I know I could have done. There were, like, generators that I could have powered up, but I could just never find the gas can so that I could put it into the generator, and I'm sure it unlocked something. But I was willing to just kind of like walk away from doing every single thing on every single map to move on to the next section. And the game doesn't really feel like it penalizes you for it. Would it have been cool to see that stuff? Would I have found something really neat? Possibly. But it's not going to really hinder my ability to do the next section of the game, and the section after that, and the section after that. The characters that you have in the story are actually. They feel ancillary, but they focus in on specific soldiers at different points. Artyom goes with certain characters in certain places and works beside them. Some new characters come into play over the course of the story. Some are left in the chapters after you finish them because they have new purpose. It gives everybody on the train a little bit of a story arc right up until the very end. There is a, a really satisfying conclusion and you feel like everyone kind of had a, a story arc that they went through. When I originally played Metro Exodus, I was playing on console and I had a controller in my hands. And I Felt like it was frustrating. This time, I played with a mouse and keyboard. It was not frustrating. If you're going to play a shooter, I really do think that a mouse and keyboard is better. It just makes it so much more accurate to uh, hit your targets. I did try it with a controller for a little bit to see how it felt, and immediately I was like, nope. <laughs> nope, nope, it, it, it's, a, it's a frustrating experience. But with a mouse and keyboard, headshot, 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 you, you know, just, I, I, can, I can just target with, like, much better precision, and it becomes a much less frustrating experience, especially with the amount of times in this game where they just jump you with so many enemies. Uh, if you're doing this with a controller and you're feeling frustrated, you're not alone, 
Uh, if, if you are going to play with a controller, I guess focus on shotguns. That's all I can say. <laughs> Just shotgun all day long, apparently. The different areas and the uh, different weapons that they start presenting you with for those areas all feel very unique. You know, you start out in the tundras, and then you move to, like, a desert area, and then you move to, like, a jungle area, and it all kind of, like, comes back full circle toward the end. There are unique enemies and unique monsters in these areas. It feels like every single one of them has, like, a big bad creature that you may fight directly, or that you may encounter in certain ways throughout the course of the game. They are very cool, and they kind of become highlights of the overall game. There is also an interactivity with the other people in the world. For instance, you can holster your gun. And if you meet locals and you holster your gun, they will now interact with you because they realize you're not going to shoot them. You could also shoot them. But they can have valuable information that you can utilize as well. And they might have side quests or information about the world and how to interact with it that could be very useful. And this is done, again, all through like a lack of a HUD or dialogue options. You don't have those in this game. You just do things and the world reacts to you. Overall, Metro Exodus is one of those games that can be a little bit weird to get into. But if you take a little bit of time and you try to get used to it a little bit more, you start to find that it's actually a, a satisfying game experience for the 20-something hours that you play it. Some things I would have liked to see, I would have liked to be able to make manual saves. Like when I got to the end of a chapter, before I started a new chapter, if it turned out there were some neat things I wanted to explore later, I could just go back to that chapter. You do have a chapter select, but it will obviously start you at the beginning of that chapter. Uh, so that, that it would have been nice to just put down manual saves instead of just having the auto saves. There are some pretty extensive pieces of the game where you are basically just sitting there and in the middle of hearing other people talk, and Artyom is a silent protagonist except during narration. And so you're just sitting there and have very little interaction that you can do except maybe picking up a cigarette or a cup of coffee that's in front of you. That is pretty much the extent of that. And for some of the things that you do in the game, you're pretty much just roped into sitting there doing nothing for many minutes on end, uh, waiting for the action to start again. <laughs> Moral choices are technically in the game where you can have, like, good or bad endings. It is pretty much just predicated on whether you're knocking out enemies or killing them. And so most of those moral choices pretty much revolve around pushing one button or another. Uh, if you're actively under attack, it doesn't seem to matter if you shoot enemies what does matter is that at a certain point, when you are in a firefight, if you've, you know, killed an enough of the enemies and they're not making any progress, the remaining enemies will surrender. And when they surrender, you can choose whether you're going to knife them in the face or you just want to knock them out and take their stuff. And this is pretty much the extent of, like, doing the moral thing in the game. It's very rudimentary, very surface level, and it does, doesn't really change much of the storyline except, like, what ending you get. So that could have probably been fleshed out, too. Your weapons will jam. This does make sense, because weapons do jam. A lot of the times it's because your weapon is dirty and you need to clean it. But you can only clean your guns when you are at crafting stations. And if you haven't wandered across one of those in a while, uh, you're kind of out of luck. And it gets 
very frustrating when you're in the middle of a firefight and your weapon jams like every time two bullets are fired and you have to wait and try and do this thing with it. Uh, it gets very frustrating at that point because you're like, well, I don't have the ability to even clean it at this point. So what do you want me to do? I guess I move to a different gun, but it's not really the gun I want to use in this situation. A lot of this is just nitpicky. It's not game breaking or anything. And frankly, I have to say that there really aren't bugs or glitches that I can speak to in the game. It, it's actually a very solid, smooth gaming experience and uh, feels very satisfying when you're playing it. I like the formula that they did here. It is definitely more open-ended than some of the other Metro games that came before it, but it's not so open-ended that it doesn't feel like there's forward momentum. Like you're just going around and you know, tooling. You're not. You are going places with purpose. Those smaller, more boxed-in areas that are still explorable works really well for this. And I appreciate what they did with it. I'm glad I gave it a second chance. I would recommend playing it. And uh, this, was a, this was a net positive experience for a second chance. So, uh, Metro Exodus, you deserved your second chance. I know that that counts for a lot for you. It is now time for you to leave the confines of this mine. You're going to go out into an irradiated world that is full of dangers and giant bats and mutant bears. And... Hmm? It's not irradiated. You know what? I'll come with you then. Let me get my backpack. Hold on. Gonna get my backpack. Okay, so I got my backpack, and I'm ready to go, and... Now I'm stuck down here. With the spiders. Oh god!